What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. This is Bunk Bed Breakdowns, BDGE's very own Dynasty show. And as always, every Wednesday, I'm joined by my man, Mike, at Mike Me Up on Twitter. Mike, you just went on a hike. I just got sunburned out of my fucking life. So how are you feeling in that California sun? Dude, it feels good to get outside. It's freaking COVID. Stay inside orders is driving me fucking insane. So it's good to get outside, man. That's all I can say. Get some sunlight, you know, cure that depression. Uh, you know, hopefully uh, exciting things ahead. Yeah, I imagine California is pretty strict with their rules. I was in Massachusetts for the weekend, and they, like, ripped every rim off of every basketball hoop. <laughs> Everything is down. You just, like, can't do anything. But we're going to move past COVID. We're going to start talking about rookie receivers and running backs and quarterbacks and tight ends, all the guys you should be targeting in your rookie drafts, even if they have ended, guys you can shoot offers out there for because you know not much information has happened between the rookie draft and now, and you can acquire them for pretty cheap before we start talking about them, start hyping them up and their value starts to skyrocket. So without further ado, let's hit that intro. Hit it. Kicking it off with the most important position in football, but somehow not the most important position in fantasy, unless you're playing super flex. We got Jalen Hurts, you know, so this is our all buy team and, you know, we're looking for value here. So it doesn't really, doesn't really give much value if we tell you to buy Joe Burrow who's going like a top three pick. Um, but we think that there's a decent value to be had here for Jalen Hurts. Now he's not going to be someone that, that starts for your team right away. So if you're, you're sitting there with like, you know, Ben Roethlisberger and Mitch Trubisky as your quarterbacks, like this is not going to be the band aid that fixes it. But what I will say is he's a he's a high upside, um, low, extremely low floor uh, shot in terms of uh, a, dart, a rookie dart to fire. But he does have the Konami code and he's a proven winner. Right. I think that's what it comes down to for me. Like over the over the past couple of years, like everyone's looking for that prototype of a of a quarterback, the tall guy, the six, five, 220 pounds has a cannon for an arm. Uh, but Justin when it Herber, comes to, I like the yeah. picture painting. Yeah, exactly. When it comes down to it, though, like at the end of the day, like you want winners, right? And, you know, as we've seen with guys like Trubisky and, and even guys like Goff, like these prototype guys, they're not necessarily the winners. And it, it always brings me back to the Trubisky versus Watson debate. And I don't want to talk about Patrick Mahomes because he's someone that I think everyone missed on. But it just like always boggled my mind that, that the Chicago Bears decided to choose a like basically proven loser in Mitch Trubisky over a bona fide winner in Deshaun Watson I think that's what I see in Jalen Hurts he's a winner he's got the rushing floor and he's currently going at 29th overall rookie pick 3.05 in super flex drafts per DLF's May ADP so that's QB5 and he's going behind Jordan Love and I think he's someone that I'd be willing to take a shot on at that price given he's going behind uh, someone who I don't really think is a starting quarterback uh, in the NFL yeah, and they're in very similar situations, right? They're sitting behind a quarterback that is proven in this league. Aaron Rodgers, I think, has like three or four more years left on his deal. Carson Wentz got the bag, but Carson Wentz hasn't been able to stay healthy despite him playing like 16 games a ton of times. He just he goes out there hobbled a lot of the time, and Jalen Hurts can go out there, get you, you know, 40, 50 rushing yards. That's good enough to be a quarterback one on the week. It's not out of the range of possibilities if we see what happened to Lamar Jackson his rookie year. Instead of Joe Flacco sucking, we see Carson Wentz get hurt, and then Jalen Hurts is a QB1 down the stretch. And if he proves to be a valuable piece of this offense, what's to say – like, this is obviously, like, complete conjecture. But what's to say they don't move on from Carson Wentz with all that money? Somebody else is going to want to pay for him. They roll out Jalen Hurts. That's definitely best-case scenario, so you shouldn't hope for that because if you do that for him, you want to do that for everybody. But as Mike said, he has the upside that you want out of the quarterback position. And if that were to happen, right – He's surrounded by a ton of weapons now that they brought in Jalen Rager. They have a bunch of other fast guys that probably suck at catching the ball. They also have Dallas Goddard. They have Zach Ertz, who may or may not be there by the time Jalen Hurts starts. But this always seems to be a very fantasy-friendly situation in Philadelphia. And if he does get the opportunity to start, he's going to be a very valuable fantasy quarterback. Going behind Jordan Love, Jordan Love is, as I said before, in a similar situation, but he's extremely raw. He is pretty mobile, pretty athletic, but he is not nearly the same type of runner as Jalen Hurts. And that offense is pretty devoid of talent, especially considering that all the running backs are going to be gone next year and A.J. Dillon is an absolute fraud. So I'm with you, Mike. If it's between Hurts and Love, just give me Jalen Hurts every day of the week. 
Yeah, I mean, I think PFF actually really loved Jalen Hurts as well. They had him as ranked as the fourth overall quarterback uh, after Justin Herbert. Just disrespectful. But in terms of, like, all the metrics, his deep ball passing, you know, we talk about CeeDee Lamb and how great he was, and CeeDee Lamb is an absolute stud, right? But Jalen Hurts also has to get on the ball in those deep plays. And I think when it comes down to it, for me, it's like for someone like Hurts, when the play breaks down, you can kind of trust him to, to like, you know, free will it, you know, kind of, like, make, make create stuff on his own, whereas guys like, Justin Herbert and Jordan Love just don't have the athleticism or even the raw instincts to do that, right? Like, if you, if you watch Jordan Love play, I mean, it's literally a coin flip if he's going to throw an interception or not on, like, some of the easiest routes, especially the outside the number outside the number throws. Like, I think that's where he's going to be incredibly vulnerable, where if you're in tight spaces in the red zone, I mean, if I were to bet money, like, and he's throwing it up for a one of those prayer passes, like, it's going to be an interception because the guy just – I mean, doesn't really have it in him. And, you know, Jalen Hurts also gets knocked on for his anticipation, right? He's not an anticipatory thrower. He doesn't read great in terms of defenses. You know, a lot of these same knocks were on Deshaun Watson when he came out. But when winners and guys that have a good work ethic usually find a way to get it done. And I think Jalen Hurts does that. He's definitely – he was one of the most lethal, uh, accurate deep passers in the league. So you kind of want to see that as well. Granted, it's from the Oklahoma system, but – in this area of the draft, you're firing darts, right? You're just, you're just like praying for something to hit. And when I look for guys that I want to hit, I'm looking for like literally upside only. I don't care about some guy that just like might or may not become a starter and just like have a couple starter weeks for you. If I want someone where like, if I hit, it's an absolute fucking smash. And that's what Jalen Hurts could be. Yeah. And he's in the NFC East too. So although the big 12 doesn't play defense, the Giants, the Redskins, the Cowboys, well, the Cowboys are decent defense, but like those guys don't really play that much defense. Six games a year, he's probably going to put up like if he does start a quarterback one week. So as you said, it's just, it's high risk, but it's very high reward. And the risk isn't even that great considering he's a third round pick and him not starting for the foreseeable future is baked into his price. Exactly. Next up, no surprise. One of our favorites with the NFC East, we have, the motherfucking God, Antonio Gibson. Now, when he was drafted, well, first off, I was surprised that A.J. Dillon went ahead of him. I was, like, super pissed at that. But then he <laughs> snuck his way into the early third round, and he landed in a spot that originally I was pretty upset about because if this guy pulls his hamstring, he's pretty much his career is done because Washington Redskins, their training facility, their medical staff – is one of the worst we've ever seen. And I'm a Chargers fan, so I I speak from experience. But (laughs) looking at the opportunity that's left over, this team has actually leaves behind 8.8 vacated targets per game, which is the eighth most in the NFL. And correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, but all they really added is Antonio Gandy-Golden, J.D. McKissick, and Antonio Gibson. So there's not really much else. I know they added like a ton of running backs that don't have hands, so I don't weigh that very heavily. Obviously, they don't have knees either. (laughs) They barely have knees, too. (laughs) Uh, they also had uh, Kelvin Harmon. They also, or they had Kelvin Harmon, who's probably going to step into a slightly bigger role. Same with Steven Sims, but there's a lot of volume to go around. And you could obviously say he's going to step into that Chris Thompson role, right? But I would argue that that's more of Jay Gruden's system than it is Ron Rivera's, who's now coming into this offense. But we look at what Ron Rivera has been exposed to in the past, and he is no stranger to these versatile weapons, right? In Carolina, he's had Devin Funches, who Although he isn't great at football, you know, he transitioned from tight end to wide receiver, and he had a few decent seasons at the beginning of his career. Same with Curtis Samuel. He was a multi-positional player at Ohio State, and although he wasn't great, he had all the opportunity in the world. He had, like, more air yards than Amelia Earhart last year. He didn't produce, but at least the volume was there. And even Scott Turner, Norv Turner, Norv Turner, I can't pronounce these guys' fucking names, Norv (laughs) Turner's son had uh, Jarek McKinnon and Cordero Patterson during his time in Minnesota. So there have been a multitude of players that both guys have been exposed to uh, vicariously for Scott Turner that have played multiple positions and they've tried to give them a ton of targets, a ton of opportunity. And the fact that Antonio Gibson was an early third round pick, the fact that this offense has no weapons, the fact that their running game isn't great because their offensive line is middle of the pack and now they don't have the hope of bringing back Trent Williams I think it's going to be a team that wants to pass the ball because there's no way they're going to win running it unless they want to tank again, which is definitely in the cards. But um, with Haskins behind center, a guy who's not going to push it down the field a ton because he doesn't have a lot of time to throw. And the only deep threat he has is Terry McLaurin, who they'd obviously want to get out in space more than just deep shots every game. Leads me to believe that Antonio Gibson is also going to get a ton of usage because Dwayne Haskins last year targeted the running back position at a 21% rate which was middle of the pack. But in the games where Chris Thompson played, that spiked up to 23%, which was top 10 in the NFL. So he's somebody who's going to be targeting the backfield and the slot a ton. 
And the fact that Antonio Gibson seems to be a running back that's going to be used out of the backfield, and if not, probably a slot receiver because he's not a very refined route runner and they just want to get him open in space. He seems to be a very, very good fit for this up-and-coming offense. And if Dwayne Haskins does take a step forward, which I personally expect because he was thrown into the fire kind of like Josh Rosen in his rookie year, then this offense as a whole can grow. And Antonio Gibson can be part of not only that running back stable, but that wide receiver stable going forward. Yeah, I mean, I, I was like you. You know, I think we were on the live stream and we both reacted and said, like, fuck! Like, why did he have to land there? But, like, the more you think about it, I think for running backs, man, it really, it's always comes down to, like, volume and opportunity. And, you know, I actually don't think he's going to get a ton of opportunity in year one just because I think he's going to try and learn. He needs to, like, learn the position. Now, first of all, he's a completely raw athlete. But they invested a 3.02, not just an early pick, the second pick in the third round, right? So you're really flirting with, like, second-round draft capital there. And, you know, we know Geis has the problems. And, you know, if Geis is fully healthy, I fully expect Geis to retain that leading role because he's still a really really good running back he just you know been injured his entire career but that's obviously up in the air like Bryce Love has like no knees uh you know feel bad for the guy but I don't expect him to really get on the field and you got a bunch of Jags on the field that just aren't great athletes right so I think in terms of like this part of the draft you know we're looking at again in third round draft capital 3.04 and super flex I've seen him creep into the late late second but even at that price I'm still happily uh copping the buy button on him Everyone has question marks, right? It's a question of who do you want, like what attributes you want to target. And for me, it's about guys that have ability to win in different ways. And he can win in the receiving game. He can win in the running game. Like he's someone where you can give him, you know, call it like 10 touches a game, hopefully. And he could definitely be fantasy relevant. He could provide that RB3, maybe like low RB2, which doesn't sound sexy, I know. But like not everyone can have like four RB1 starting for the league. So this is someone that's going to be a starter. It's someone that I'm going to be patient with. If he doesn't explode right away, I'm going to hold on to him and, you know, see what happens. Because I think that in that offense, you know, in, in Rivera's team and on the Redskins, he's got a ton of opportunity just because of the competition there. And one thing I will say is, you know, you mentioned that the medical staff is awful. And by God, like literally the worst freaking medical Dude, staff. Those Alex Smith fired. pictures were gruesome. That oh, was my disgusting. God. Like, like, think about the people that went through, right? Alex Smith. RG3 because they made him play on a fucking torn ACL and destroyed his career, right? They got Trent uh, Trent Williams, who basically refused to go back to the team. That's how bad the medical staff was. Like, this is easily one of the worst medical staffs and ownerships of all time. But I will say, I read that when Ron Rivera went in, he totally cleaned house. So all those, like, idiots in that medical team, like, they're gone. He brought in his own people. So I'm hopeful. Uh, I'm cautiously optimistic. I'm not saying it's totally fixed, but... You know, I think I think there is some brighter days ahead for both him and Geis. And I think if they can kind of like if he can work in his role where he gets like seven to eight carries and like four to five targets a game, which is not unrealistic based on what we've seen Chris Thompson do. Uh, I think a healthy Antonio Gibson can can definitely be a relevant fantasy asset going forward. Yeah, two things. One, I hope he didn't bring over the medical staff that worked on Cam Newton because that would be <laughs> just as bad. And number two, just talking about value, right? A.J. Dillon is going ahead of him. And I'll pose this question to you, Mike. What's more likely, Antonio Gibson catches 50 balls this year or A.J. Dillon has five touchdowns in his rookie year? Ooh, that's a, that's a good one. That's a good line to set there. Ah, man, I want to say Gibson has 50 catches, but that, that is, I would say maybe, man, I would say like 40-something targets. I don't know about 50 catches. That's, that's the a fact lot. that you had to think about that just tells you that Antonio <laughs> Gibson is a much better pick because 50 receptions is a fucking crazy number for a running back. And the yeah. fact that you had to think about that and A.J. <laughs> Dillon getting five little tumbles into the end zone lets you know that A.J. Dillon as the RB8 off the board is not the move. Look, here's the thing. Like, you know, people are worried about A.J. Dillon. And you know what? They should be, right? Because at the end of the day, Packers invested – draft capital but also at the end of the day they have one of the best red zone five yard like goal line rushing backs in the league like aaron jones has been borderline unstoppable in that region and i mean i think all it takes is a couple of aj Dillon running into the back of his own linemen for them to realize like hey this guy might not be the answer on the goal line. Like we hey, already have one of these. Jamal in. Williams. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So look, no knock to AJ Dillon truthers, but I just like in this area of the draft, I'm looking for like the explosive playmakers. And even though Dylan is a great athlete, a phenomenal athlete, I'm not looking to draft fullbacks in <laughs> at this part of my draft. Yeah, All right. <laughs> Next up, uh, another Someone that's, I guess, he's been going up and he went up and down. I was a roller coaster on him. I don't know about for you either, but it's LaVisca Chanel. You know, Noah put out that fire ass video on him. If you haven't seen it, go on Twitter, 
look at it. Probably the best two minutes you ever spend in your entire life. But, you know, he's someone where, like, the talent was incredible. It was immense. And then, you know, he was injured and everyone's worried about the injuries. And then that was, like, compounded when he went to the combine and decided to run the 40 with a parachute on his back. Uh, you see a shirt at the combine? He looks like MC Hammer. He was <laughs> yeah. like a triple XL. Wasn't even tucked yeah. in. Yeah. He, he's going as the 19th overall rookie, the 2.07 and the wide receiver 10. And ever since the, since the draft, I think I've become, you know, irrationally high on LaVisca Chanel. I've just been trying to get him everywhere. Like every time I'm at the top of the second, I'm like, you know what? I don't want to pick here. I just want to trade back five picks and try and get Visca. Just incredible talent, tiny ass hands. So if you don't like small hand wide receivers, you probably don't want to draft him. But just great talent with the ball in his hands. And just to me, it was literally the perfect fit for him because – Jacksonville needed a wide receiver bat. I've been saying that for a long time, and that's why I didn't want to buy Leonard Fournette because they've just been devoid of wide receiver talent outside of Lydia Chark, and they just go together so well because Chark is going to stretch the field. LaVisca is going to line up in the backfield, in the slot, take the, take, the, uh, take the screens, take the short intermediate routes, and just try and get that yak. You know, the, I imagine they're going to try and use him uh, similarly to how like A.J. Brown was used, although he's not as refined as A.J. Brown. Um, but in terms of like getting him the ball in space and letting him do the rest, but I've just been like, I've been falling in love with this channel. Like you got to talk me off the ledge because I'm about to go like full, like hundred percent ownership on this guy. I'm going to push you right off the edge. <laughs> there are three numbers that I'm going to say, and you have to guess what they mean. Ready? Okay. 101, 90 and 100. 101, 90 and 100. Complete mixed okay. bag. It's it. You're probably not gonna guess it. Those are the targets that D.D. Westbrook, Chris Conley, and oh, Leonard okay. Fournette saw last year. <laughs> you mean to tell me Lavisca Chenault isn't gonna rival 100 targets last this year when D.D. Westbrook was averaging like nine yards a catch and saw 101? Chris Conley, who's never been good at football, he just jumped high and ran fast at the combine and saw 90. And Leonard Fournette, like, I don't want to disparage this guy any further than what we have in the past, but he saw 100 targets last year. Sure, John DeFilippo is gone, and that's a guy who wants to pass a ton, but. When you consider A.J. Boye is gone, Jalen Ramsey is gone, they sent Calais Campbell away for like a rotisserie chicken and like a $5 <laughs> gift card to Walmart, and now Yannick Ngakwe is airing his grievances on Twitter for everybody to see. This defense is going to suck ass. Their offensive line blows. Leonard Fournette can't run the ball. They're going to be forced to pass no, no matter how much we think that Jay Gruden wants to run the ball, which like he doesn't even want to do that that much because when he had Kirk Cousins, he was actually throwing it. His passing numbers did dip these past few years, but what do you expect when you have like Colt McCoy, Dwayne Haskins, and Alex Smith behind center? So this is a team that I expect to throw the ball not only because they're you know devoid of running talent and a defense, but because I want to see what Minshew has, right? If they are a bad team this year, and they end up with a first pick, good. They get Trevor Lawrence. If they are good this year, that means Gardner Minshew is pretty good, and that means that he's tethered to a quarterback for the foreseeable future. So either way, LaVisca Chanel seems to be in a situation where his quarterback is going to be decent at worst, and he's going to be in an offense that wants to throw the ball because, quite frankly, they don't have a lot to do in the running game. And on top of that, those numbers I listed off before with D.D. Westbrook, Chris Conley, and Leonard Fournette, all three of those guys are free agents after this year. This is Dynasty. We're playing the long game. If he heads into 2021 as the wide receiver two, the solidified wide receiver two, because it's not inconceivable that D.D. Westbrook is the two and Conley's a three to start the year because there's no training camp uh, for what we know now. And, you know, it takes rookies a little bit to develop. But if he can be the number two heading into year two, as D.J. Chark kind of was this year, and take that step from rookie to sophomore year, you're going to get a huge ROI as a late second round pick in. As you said, Mike, he just brings such a good talent to this team that does not clash at all with DJ Chark. He can do his thing while Chark does his thing, and this offense can definitely produce more than one top 24 receiver. As Jay Gruden has shown in the past when he had Jamison Crowder, Pierre Garçon, and Deshaun Jackson all absolutely go off, and I think it was 2016. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great call. I was just going to bring up the fact that if you think about the role fit, right, like you have DJ Chark and DJX, right, from the Washington fit. And then I think Visco really slides into that, like, Pierre Garçon type role where he's a possession, big body, wide receiver that you can line up outside or in the slot. And Jacksonville passed the ball 589 times last year, okay? And that was before they had that fucking kitchen sale, uh, garage sale of their entire defense this year. Like, they are not going to be in positive game scripts. There's going to be a ton of passing volume to be had, and they have a young quarterback, which means, you know, coaches tech, try not to let their young quarterbacks do the, too much, especially ones that are drafted in the sixth round. So I really do think they're going to manufacture a lot of, like, 
easy touches where they get the ball out quick and into the hands of Visca, uh, even into the hands like Fournette and kind of just let them take course. And if we know anything, like D.D. Westbrook is not a good football player. Okay, let's just – I'm going to put that out there. I don't get why everyone was on him last year. He's not good. He's never been good. Uh, just, I just don't get it at all. So I have full confidence in whether it's this year, mid mid-year through the year, whether it's like in training camp, whether it's later on in the year, but for the long term, LaVisca is going to beat out D.D. Westbrook. I can promise you that. Um, so I think there's just like way too much opportunity, way too much pass volume, just like everything is in the air. And that's why when he fell there, I was like, this is, this is like the dream fit. Like in my, in my opinion, I think that was probably the best landing spot for a wide receiver outside of Jalen Rager and CD Lamb. And like, I, I think the upside is immense. And if you play in leagues, like I think this is like one wide receiver where I would probably even keep tabs on in redraft. I don't think I would draft them unless it's like a super deep late round pick, but I'd probably keep tabs on them because the guys that you can manufacture touches for are the ones that become fantasy relevant quicker. Like think about the Debo Samuels and, and the AJ Browns and stuff like that. Guys that can really create with the ball in their hands are the ones you want. Not yeah, the talking about Patrick manufacturing Hall. touches, right? Jay Gruden is, as we said before, the guy who made Chris Thompson a thing. Chris Thompson is now in Jacksonville, but when's the last time he's been healthy? What's to say if anything or at the very least, LaVisca Chanel is just Chris Thompson for this team. That's a huge, yeah. huge role because Leonard Fournette saw 100 targets this year. He could realistically see like 40 targets out of the backfield if they want to use him in that role. And if he has that running back eligibility, that is going to be absolutely huge. And just off that alone, it, even if he's not good at football, right, you can sell like Jalen Samuels for a decent haul because he had tight end eligibility. <laughs> if if uh, LaVisca Chanel is any good at all and he has that eligibility that you can put in the running back and receiver spot, you're going to be able to sell him for a second round pick easily. Yeah. And I actually read a really interesting article that was talking about like how much value do you get from like pulling running backs into the wide receiver and like throwing them targets. And like, turns out not many makes sense because a wide receiver is better and more efficient at catching passes than most running backs with the exception of Christian McCaffrey, who is a motherfucking God. Do not sell him anyways. Uh, but what Phil they does did, a personal attack on me, Mike, <laughs> <laughs> what they did, so what they did show is when you bring wide receivers into the backfield, it was actually a much more plus EV move just because of the mismatch it creates, right? Like the lining back, a linebacker against a running back, I would imagine is probably easier than lining back wide receiver against a linebacker. It's just a bigger mismatch. So if Gruden is smart, hopefully he is, I think creating that mismatch is going to create a lot of opportunities for him. So look guys, just don't overthink it. I think you should buy him. He's a great buy. Uh, definitely get him on your squads. I'm up to like 33, like the 40% ownership. I have him in the play, play the public league. So I was super pumped about that. But he's just a great one. Uh, yeah, so I'll be sure sending an offer there. sometime soon. <laughs> All right. Next up, another excellent wide receiver. One of Noah's favorites. Uh, he was someone I love really early on in the process from an analytical perspective. Uh, and it's Brian Edwards. And after I learned about him, like his analytical profile, like earliest breakout ever, 17-year-old breakout, Flipped it over to Noah. I was like, hey, Noah, check out this guy's film. Like, tell me what you see, right? And what did you see? You've never done that, Mike. You should have never done that because he, <laughs> ought, like, he just moved so far up my rankings from somebody I really never heard of. I heard about him last year because he was eligible, but I didn't look into him too much. I saw his play this year, and that game against Alabama, he didn't have the craziest stat line, but when you just watch, I'm going to go film grinder mode, but like his releases off the line, his physicality, the ability to win after the catch. I made a lofty comparison. It was Chris Godwin, and we obviously don't know the athleticism there, so it might be pretty fraudulent for me to say that, but just the tenacity he plays with, the ability for him to win over the middle, and just that huge frame that he has, the ability to win in the air, like he just has it all. And the fact that he landed in Las Vegas where that type of skill set isn't really matched, even though they drafted Henry Ruggs, right? He's not really a deep guy. He's somebody who can beat you after the catch with his speed. Brian Edwards is more of that Michael Crabtree, more of that possession receiver that we've seen produce in this offense before. And although Darren Waller is going to probably take up those, you know, short to intermediate targets that we would want Brian Edwards to see, I think talent just wins out in that situation. He's going to make his way onto the field as early as year one in two wide receiver sets. Yeah, I absolutely love him. Like from an analytical perspective, he checks every single box. The only one he doesn't check is an early declare, uh, you know, which is kind of important. But at the end of the day, uh, if you do miss that box, you want to be extremely dominant in your last year in college. And that's exactly what he did. Like we already talked about his 17 year old breakout and which is a hundredth percentile, but he also has a 94th percentile dominator hit like 48.4%. So he was the offense uh, for, for that, for that team. And like, 
Noah said he played in a tough division, right? So he plays in the SEC. We we love it when guys can perform in the SEC because that's where the best defenders are and arguably probably one of the only conferences where they actually do press coverage. So he has a lot of experience with that. And, you know, people threw around the Michael Thomas comp with him. And, you know, it, I, I want you to, like, try and think about in terms of a play style, not necessarily like production because obviously Mike, we know now that Michael Thomas is a total fucking stud. But – the way that they win, they're both like big body possession receivers that are going to excel on like slants in the intermediate part of the field because they know how to position themselves and they have great hands, right? So I think that's what people see when they say like Michael Thomas, uh, who was also a senior, obviously not an early big player. So if I'm looking at it from this perspective, right, three in three years, uh, who do you think is going to lead the team in points? Uh, targets and points not targets just who's going to be the leading wide receiver in Las Vegas uh, three years from now is it going to be Henry Ruggs or Brian Edwards I like he pivoted to me so I get the heat but it's definitely gonna be Brian Edwards I just believe <laughs> this guy's talent so much more than Henry Ruggs' talent yeah yeah me, me too and you know I think Henry Ruggs is going to get that work early and we don't think Henry Ruggs is bad right They're just he's got some question marks but Brian Edwards got some question marks as well but I just think that his skill set is going to translate I mean, they're both going to translate to the NFL, but I think Brian Edwards is going to translate more to like a target volume hog uh, versus Henry Ruggs. Like, I just, I don't see a world where Henry Ruggs is peppered with like 130, 140 targets, whereas I do see that world for Edwards. And I think, you know, he fell down draft boards a little bit because he didn't test. He was injured. Um, but from, by all accounts, from what I read, he is a pretty good athlete. Like, I think he probably would have run, run in like the four or fives, uh, like similar to like a Nikhil Harry type of athlete at his size. So, Look, I, I don't think there's much to hate on about Brian Edwards. I think you should get him. He's cheap right now. He's going one pick after LaVisca Chenault uh, at 2.09, so the wide receiver 11. And, you know, this is why I don't really like picking wide receivers at the end of the first, at the top of the second, because I feel like there's such great late value. And, again, he's someone else that I got on the Filet of the Public League, so I'm super happy about that. Um, and I'm going to just keep trying to gobble up those shares because I think you're getting him at a discount, and he's a, he's a pretty phenomenal talent. Yeah, two offers coming your way, Mike. Uh, and on top of that, right, Henry Ruggs played with two attack of Aloha in the SEC. Brian Edwards, I could not name who his quarterback was in any of the past four years, played in South Carolina, and he had to compete with Hayden Hurst and Debo Samuel, who, you know, Hayden Hurst is all of a sudden just one of the best tight ends in the league because he got traded to Atlanta. We know Debo Samuel is good, so the fact that he had such an early breakout age with those guys, he might have broken out the year that Debo Samuel broke his leg, so maybe that had to do with it. But the fact that even in his senior year, the year he went back, his numbers dip, but he only played 10 games. He's averaging like seven receptions, 80 yards, and like half a touchdown a game. And the game he actually got hurt in, the last game of the season against Appalachian State, he like did something with his knee, and he still went over 100 yards, and he would have had the game-winning touchdown, but his quarterback was absolutely trash. I encourage you to type in Brian Edwards versus Appalachian State, skip to the very last play of the game, and just watch what he was subjected to. And the fact that he did what he did in the SEC with competition around him and lining up across from him, just tells me he's a very good wide receiver. And the fact that the Oakland Raiders have Marcus Mariota and Derek Carr behind center, thing one and thing two, like he, he's shown he's not quarterback dependent. He can do whatever he needs to do on his own because he not only wins at the catch point, but he wins after the catch. I know Ruggs can do much of the same, but Brian Edwards has shown it through a bunch of adversity in his career. So uh, as, as we've stated before, I wouldn't be surprised if he is the wide receiver one on this team a few years down the road. Yeah, definitely. I, you weren't far off on your profile, by the way. You say you, say you comped them to uh, Chris Godwin, right? And I was just looking at Debo Samuel's athletic uh, measure, measurables, and I think Brian Edwards is probably like in that same realm, you know, like four, high 4.4, four, four, low 4.5 four, speed, uh, pretty decent burst and pretty decent catch radius. And Debo Samuel's comp on player profile is actually Chris Godwin, believe it or not. So, wow. look, I, I do think Brian Edwards is literally just Debo Samuel uh, on the Raiders, and we know that um, Derek Carr needs that dump off player to kind of get the ball in their hands. And Brian Edwards was, he like led the, he, I think he led like, he was like top three or if, if he didn't lead it, he was definitely top three in like uh, screen passes and like yards after the catch in college. Like he was just incredible with the ball in his hands. And I think it's going to work out really well for him there. So really love that fit. Next up, uh, this, I think, in my opinion, is the most undervalued rookie asset right now in fantasy draft. And it's KJ Hamler. Um, he's going in the third round, despite being drafted in the second round of the NFL draft. He has a, an, an excellent analytical profile, 19-year-old breakout, uh, basically dominated at PSU when he stepped on the field. Um, 
if you watch his like highlights, I think he's a very electric playmaker. People think he's like just a speed guy, but I find him to be very twitchy in tight spaces. Like the way he wins and makes people miss in the open field or even in tight spaces is actually pretty incredible. Um, I loved it. And I think he's a pretty good playmaker. And I think people have already written him off because he's going to the same place as Jerry Judy and Cortland Sutton, who, you know, everyone loves and Noah fan who's supposed to be like the next best tight end. But, you know, I just asked the question, like, what if we're wrong, right? Like, he's going on a third-round ADP. What if Jerry Judy is not the bust-proof, all-generational talent that we think he is? Like, what if K.J. Hamler steps in that role? What if K.J. Hamler is, like, the next Deshaun Jackson with his game-breaking speed? Uh, I just think, like, at this cost, you know, people going ahead of him are, like, Claypool and, like, backup running backs. Like, it just, like, every time I get to the third round, if K.J. Hamler's there, I'm just happy to cop the buy button. Yeah, and KJ Hamler was a second round pick despite not testing other than the bench press at the combine, which just tells you how much faith that Denver has in not only his athleticism, but his ability on the field because he tore up Ohio State in I think it was his red shirt freshman year. Mm-hmm. Like he housed that 90 yard that 90 yard screen pass and he looked by far and away the fastest player on the field. My comp for him was like a mix between Jamison Crowder and Tyler Lockett because he's in Lockett's frame, but he has that short area quickness that Jamison Crowder brings to the table. And let, let's say Cortland Sutton is going to maintain his role and Jerry Judy is good. It's not like we haven't seen a Pat Shermer led offense have more than one viable fantasy receiver, right? Whether it was Minnesota with Stefan Diggs and Adam Thielen, or even last year in New York, right? Whoever stepped up, whether it was Darius Slayton, uh, Starling Shepard, Golden Tate, Evan Ingram, all those guys, if he pays out their numbers, were over 900 yards on the season. Obviously, it wasn't concurrently, but what's to say that they can't produce three decent enough fantasy receivers? KJ Hamler doesn't have to be a top 24 guy for him to return value. He's going in the third round behind Chase Claypool, who is going to be the fourth receiver on his team. Whereas KJ Hamler at this point, I don't think is any worse of a pass catching option than Noah Fant. And he has just the same amount of opportunity as Jerry Judy to be a day one starter for that team. So, I mean, talent's going to win out here. Definitely all they have is like Tim Patrick, if he's still on the team, Uh, he definitely has a skill set that's going to match what Drew Lock can do, which is push it down the field if he needs to but he can also win after the catch. And as Nick always likes to bring up there in the AFC West, that's a division that always has to compete with Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs. And they, they're they going to have to throw the ball. They're not going to be able to beat the Chiefs, even the Chargers. I know this might be like bias, but they're decent enough offense. Maybe Herbert's going to take it down a tick, but they're going to have to be able to play keep up with guys in this division. And they're going to have to do that by throwing the ball. You're not going to be able to keep up by handing it to Melvin Gordon 3.4 yards a touch and, you know, trying to throw to Philip Lindsay out of the backfield and him dropping every other pass. You have to have these dynamic playmakers, and that's the reason why they chose KJ Hamler as high as he did because he has a good analytical profile. He is an athletic freak, and he just fits the system well. And Kyle and Pat Shermer definitely shows that he wants to be able to use more than one wide receiver at the same time. And whether that means he's an elite fantasy option, we don't know. But all you have to do is return value. And as a third-round pick, there aren't many other guys that you can really write in to have like six, 700 yards in their rookie year and be a viable fantasy contributor. Yeah, this is like the perfect guy you just put in stash on your taxi squad. And, you know, he didn't run at the uh, combine because he was injured. But he was like he was like in that conversation with Henry Ruggs and uh, Jalen Rager in terms of like who would run the fastest. Reportedly, he runs a 4-2 clocked by the by the by uh psu so we know like all these guys are probably a little bit biased but if we look at the game miles per hour he clocked in at 21.76 miles per hour rugs clocked in at 23 uh rager at 22.6 and duvernay who ran a 438 clocked in at 21.1 so he's definitely up there in terms of the speed guys and you know one thing that's off on player profiler i think they have him at like 511 he's actually 59 so even though he's a little bit smaller 5'9", 178, he's pretty, he's pretty thick, and he's pretty dense. He put up like 17 reps on the bench, which is freaking insane at 178. So, look, I think this guy, you know, the one knock against him, I think, is size, obviously, and also he struggles a bit with drops. Uh, you know, we don't really care that much about drops unless it's like actually a scared of getting hit type of thing versus concentration drops. So I don't really focus too much on that. But I think, I think he's just a great hedge in an offense that's trying to go pass heavy, uh, that has to compete with the Chiefs. You know, like we, we always like to think that where we know what's going on, but you know, the wide receivers that we draft early aren't always the ones that pan out, right? Just look at AJ Brown, look at all these guys. Like what if KJ Hamler is the guy that, that kind of pans out over, over some of these top prospects. And I think just given the draft capital, given the analytical profile, given everything that, that he checks, 
I think a third round cost is just, is just way too low. So I think he's someone that I'm trying to basically get in every single rookie draft and I've gotten a lot of him, but I want to get more of him. I think even now, like if you miss on him in, in rookie drafts, I think you can easily send an offer for him. Like maybe you can send next year's third plus like another fringe player, like plus like a handcuff, like maybe like Alexander Madison plus like next year's third. I would cop the buy button on KJ Hamler at that price. And I think you could get it done pretty easily. Yeah, they'll definitely get the deal done. And another speedster that I really like after Mike recommended me watching him is Darnell Mooney, the wide receiver from, I believe, Tulane. And it's not great that I don't even know where he went to college. And <laughs> I'm going to be completely honest with you guys, as many of you guys are as well. I'm unfamiliar with Darnell Mooney in depth. But what I do know is he has a great analytical profile when looking at his breakout age, his college target share, and his college dominator rating. 92nd percentile breakout age, top the 72nd percentile on both college dominator rating and college target share. And he's an athletic freak, right? He's he's pretty small. He's kind of in this similar body type as KJ Hamler. Uh, he ran a 4.38 40-yard dash, so his speed score isn't as lofty as his pure 40-yard dash in terms of percentile. He also has a 71st percentile burst score. But when you're going for guys as late as he is going, which is basically undrafted, I think he's 55th or 57th off the board. So if you're doing a four-round draft, he's not going drafted. If you're doing a five-round draft, he's one of the last picks. Um, he's just somebody you can take a shot on because he's the perfect definition of low risk, high reward because he landed in Chicago, a team that does not have anything in terms of wide receiver depth. I believe right now on their depth chart, their wide receiver three is Ted Ginn, which just tells you how little they have on that team. Um, and what, what really leads me to say that I would want to invest in him is what Chicago has shown over the past few years in terms of what they're trying to do in their receiving room. They have Allen Robinson, and then two years back, they drafted Anthony Miller in the second round, but they also paid Taylor Gabriel $26 million in the same year that they drafted Anthony Miller in the second round, which just tells you that they want to have three receivers and a good blend of talents with a field stretcher in Taylor Gabriel, a slack and Anthony Miller, and just a do-it-all X in Allen Robinson. Obviously, two of those guys are still there. Taylor Gabriel is gone. And again, they showed last year they want a third receiver by drafting Riley Ridley, who absolutely stinks in the fourth round. Now they go out and get Darnell Mooney, who is basically Taylor Gabriel, but a little bit bigger, right? We touched on his athleticism. Uh, and watching his tape, he's decent at jump balls, but he also plays in the same division as UConn, and those guys get blown out like 100 nothing every week. So the competition <laughs> isn't great. But the fact that he brings a different skill set to this team, the fact that they actually spent draft capital on him going as a fifth-round pick, um, I was high on Emmanuel Hall last year because he he brought a similar skill set, but he was undrafted and he did absolutely nothing. But uh, Darnell Mooney kind of checking every box except draft capital, but considering that the only guys he has to compete with don't have draft capital or are 35 years old, uh, leads me to believe that if Chicago does want to use more three wide receiver sets, because I believe they only ran them at the 23rd highest rate last year, which was pretty low. Um, if they do want to run them more, Darnell Mooney has a good as good of a shot as anybody on this team to make it onto the field even day one. Now, for fantasy relevance, that's probably not much because you still have the dynamic duo of Nick Foles and uh, Mitchell Trubisky slinging the ball and probably handing it off a million times because they can't throw it at all. But <laughs> the chances of him being going from undrafted to being able to flip him for a third or fourth round rookie pick is pretty high because once the offseason hits, if it does ever hit and the preseason happens and this guy just starts to show that he's good at football because he's good with the ball in his hands, he's good at you know making deep receptions then you're going to be able to make that you're going to make that trade because the hype gets out of control and on the off chance he actually is a, a fantasy producer for you and he gets like 3 to 400 yards in his rookie year you can get like a similar haul that Hunter Renfro would get you right now which is definitely a win and on top of that you look at what Taylor Gabriel was actually doing these past few years he was on pace for i believe 83 targets this year or 85 targets this year and then 93 in 2018 so it's not like they're not uh, targeting deep guys the ball isn't getting there because it is Mitchell Trubisky but there's at least volume in this offense um, similar to the Jacksonville Jaguars their offensive line stinks and they can't really run the ball so I wouldn't be surprised with the signing of Nick Foles they try to take a little bit more uh, deep shots this year and if that means Darnell Mooney is a little bit more involved in this offense than we may expect then he's going to return value for you as an undrafted player yeah that, I mean that's like what you're hoping for right with these undrafted players you're trying to hit a guy on the waiver or in the fourth or fifth round where like if they make a starting roster, you can flip him for a third, right? If he has a big game, you can flip him for a third. If he has an even bigger game, you can flip him for a second. Like this is where the guys like Darius Slayton's, the, the Preston Williams of last year, like this is kind of where, where we kind of flirt with those types of guys. And, you know, like Noah, I was initially drawn to him because of the profile. And, you know, the role does make sense, right? Because they, they gave Taylor Gabriel 90 targets. Uh, I know nobody remembers that, 
uh, but it did happen. And, you know, he wasn't great with them, uh, but he kind of filled that role in need for them. So that's kind of what you're hoping for with these late round guys. And the reason why we have Monty is because you can get him. Like you can't always get can like the Jonathan Taylors and the Clyde Edwards Alaris in your team. You can't always get the LaVisca Chanel's even on your team. But when there's these guys this late, you can actually have a hundred percent ownership unless I'm in your league, in which case I will have Darnell Mooney. But if I'm not in your league, I guarantee you most of your casual leagues um, are not even going to know his name. So just go check the waiver wire and see if you can pick him up. And if you're in the rookie draft, just, you know, use your fifth round pick on him. Yeah. Put him on your taxi squad. No harm, no foul. If he does break out, you can remember that you heard him here first on this <laughs> podcast. If he doesn't break out, just like wipe it from your memory. I'm trying to keep a good track record like you saying, Bolt. So uh, if he doesn't break out, so be it. He was just a taxi squad stash. I had Emmanuel Butler on my taxi squad and Demaria Crockett. So uh, that just tells you the type of players that you've put on your, on your roster that don't really take up a roster spot. So, you know, it, it's a dart that you can throw and it's a, it's, it's not even really a dart because he's just free. He's just somebody yeah. you pick up off the waiver wire after your draft. And if he breaks out, that's, that's just great for you. Yep. Next up, another God amongst men, Adam Trout God. So he's someone where we were super high on him going into the draft. The draft, I'm sorry, going into the combine. Uh, the combine was a little bit disappointing because he ran a slow 40, but then he ran like a, he did like a blazing agility drill, like just really, really agile for someone that size. And then coming out of the com, uh, coming out of the draft, it was even more exciting when he landed in the New Orleans Saints because we know they have Jared Cook there, but he's obviously, you know, basically a dinosaur and is probably on his last legs here, either retiring or transitioning to a new team. So Adam Troutman is going to be able to kind of fill that role. He's currently going as 39th overall, so in the fourth round at 4.03 as a tight end two. The reason why we think you need to get him is because I think for the majority of people, they're going to go for Cole Komet, and we're telling you just don't do it. I just do every time. If you're going to think about drafting the Cole Komet button, just don't fucking do it because he's not very good. Um, he is someone – he's one of those guys where – you know when I say like we're trying to shoot for upside uh, in these late rounds where if they hit, it's going to be a great hit. He's like the one where like if you hit, you're just like, oh, okay, like I feel no different about it. It's like winning like <laughs> – it's like buying a lottery and then winning like $5, which is like a dollar less than your purchase cost back. That's what it feels like to hit on Cole Komet, I think. So I think Adam Troutman is the clear tight end one, even though he did not go as the tight end one in this class. Um, just given like, you know, Noah did the, did the film analysis on him. So I'll let him speak on, I'll let you speak on that. But just from an analytical perspective in terms of like yards per route run efficiency, this guy was top of the class, uh, top three. The only knock against him is really just the competition. But honestly, if you're a tight end, you're getting a thousand yards receiving in college. Like you have my immediate and undivided attention. Yeah. We've seen so many good tight ends come from small schools and dominate, whether it be Dallas Goddard or Adam Shaheen. Um, and you know, he didn't test great at the combine, but you, you watch this guy play and he's just dominant. And of course he was playing against like high school seniors and people that probably shouldn't have been matched up against a third round NFL pick, but for his size, he's very agile. And that isn't just, a, that isn't just subjective he is objective because he ran a faster three cone drill than basically every receiver, not named Denzel Mims at the combine. 95th and his percentile. landing spot was key because not only does Drew Brees like to target tight ends, but they bring in Jameis Winston, who. Last year, despite O.J. Howard being an absolute idiot, kept throwing him the ball, which leads me to believe that if Drew Brees is done in one or two years' time and Jameis Winston shows enough growth with his new LASIK eyes and his golf ball swing <laughs> that he's been doing with a helmet on, that you know he, they're going to put him behind center and he's going to be able to pepper Adam Troutman. And looking into New Orleans' numbers last year, what they did with the tight end, the tight end position, obviously Jared Cook is like 39 years old, but he was still very productive. He was a top 12 tight end. And that's because he scored a lot of touchdowns. And you look at what the Saints did in the red zone. They targeted tight ends at the 10th highest rate last year. And the tight ends on the Saints saw the eighth most targets in the red zone last year. So if anything, Adam Troutman is going to be a big dude in the red zone who is going to be obviously behind Michael Thomas, but probably ahead of Alvin Kamara in terms of passing in the red zone for this offense. And they don't really have that many weapons behind MT and AK. They obviously have Emmanuel Sanders, but just like Jared Cook, he's probably going to be done in one or two years' time along with Drew Brees, and he's just a play for the future. If you want to pass on him and hope he has a Jay Sternberger type of rookie year and you can acquire him on the low, then maybe go for it. But I think people will realize that, you know, as Jared Cook is gone and this opportunity opens up and it's an offense that wants to use a tight end, unlike Green Bay, which is where Jay Sternberger is, 
then people aren't going to want to sell him cheap. So I would just personally spend, you know, an, a late third to early fourth round pick on what I believe to be the tight end one in this class in a class that's pretty devoid of tight end talent. And I don't think it's too bold to say that at least one year of his career, he's going to be like a top 12, top 10 tight end, because that's just what New Orleans does. Like Kobe Fleener, if anything, he'll just be like a huge hype player that you can end up selling because that one year that Kobe Fleener was there where he did nothing, he still had like 50 receptions, 600 yards, and he was sharing the field with three receivers that went over 900 yards. They obviously don't have that depth anymore in New Orleans, but this is just a system that pumps out tight ends, whether it's Jimmy Graham, Benjamin Watson, or Kobe Fleener, or Jared Cook. And I think Adam Troutman is just the next guy in line there. Yeah, I mean, obviously the key risk there is whether or not Drew Brees stays, but then bringing in Winston and Winston agreeing to go for basically like chump change and a bag of chips uh, tells you, one, the QB market is not that hot, but two, um, he probably wants to learn there and might have a future there. I would love to see Jameis Winston there. Honestly, Jameis Winston is too fucking good. I mean, he's not great as a quarterback, but he's too good and he's has his accomplishments are too great for him to not have a job in the NFL. And it would just make a lot of sense for them to go to New Orleans, even though there's all this freaking hoobla and noise about, uh, you know, what's his name? Taysom Hill becoming a quarterback. Guys, Taysom Hill is not going to be a quarterback. I'm sorry to break it to you. Even though they place the greatest bait of all time by putting a first round tender on him. And no matter what they say, like they're just, I just don't think he's a quarterback. They're going to save it because they want to keep him happy. Right. They still need him. He's a playmaker. He's a great NFL player, but I just don't think he's going to be a quarterback. And he's certainly in damn hell is not going to be a better quarterback than Jameis Winston. So this is going to be a long play. Do not expect returns on Adam Troutman. Don't expect returns on tight ends in general, but at a cost of the fourth round pick, maybe a late third, even if you want to reach a little bit and grab him, totally fine with it. I have a ton of Adam Troutman on my teams and I'm just going to put him on a taxi squad and let him sit there and marinate for the next, uh, you know, two to three years and try and hope to get that, you know, at a Dallas Goddard type return where like, I'm, I'm almost certain you're going to see him on the field similar to how we saw Dallas Goddard. And he's going to have like a couple of big games. You're going to be like, oh shit, like this is the next Dallas Goddard. And you're going to be able to either keep him and ride him or sell him for Dallas Goddard value, which is just fantastic value in the fourth round. So get him on your teams. Take the, instead of taking a backup running back again, just take the best tight end or another really good wide receiver available. Just, just don't draft backup running backs. I just can't say this enough. Yeah, he's going behind Eno Benjamin, who was a seventh round pick and is behind Kenyon Drake and Chase Edmonds. Like, I'll take Troutman any day of the week because the chances of him producing are probably a lot higher than Eno Benjamin ever becoming more than the RB2 in yeah. the Arizona Cardinals offense. Exactly. And just don't draft Cole Komet, man. Just, you don't want <laughs> Kyle Rudolph. I'm just telling you right now, you do not want Kyle Rudolph. All right. Uh, next up, last guy, super deep sleeper. Noah, take this one away. Another guy I don't know anything about, but if Wade's in the comments, you'll see him. This is a Virginia product named Joe Reed, and he is a Los Angeles Chargers, so I'll come to know him over the next few years. Probably not because he probably isn't good at football, but he's going undrafted similar to Darryl Moon Darnell Mooney, and you know he doesn't have the greatest analytical profile, but he is an athletic freak. He is six feet tall, 224 pounds, and ran a 447. Yes. So he's very similar to uh, Donovan Peoples-Jones, except he was more productive than Donovan Peoples-Jones. And what DPJ was good at, which was returning kicks, Joe Reed was even better than him in that department because you look at his four years in Virginia, his kick returns were disgusting. He never averaged less than 25 yards per return. Uh, his freshman year was 25.1, sophomore year 29.7, and 27.2. His senior year, 24 kick returns for 796 yards and two Jesus touchdowns. Christ. Good enough for 33 yards per return. So if anything... This late round flyer is going to be a special teamer for the Chargers. I know they like to use Desmond King out there, but he's like five foot ten, 190, soaking wet. They want to put this AJ Brown lookalike back there. And that just tells me that he's going to be able to stick around. And he is going later than KJ Hill, who was picked, I think, one or two rounds later than Joe Reed in real life. He has nowhere near the athleticism as Joe Reed. He has nowhere near the analytical profile as Joe Reed. He has nowhere near the stature as Joe Reed. And considering Hunter Henry and I believe Keenan Allen being free agents next year, if not the year after, I know Hunter Henry is after this year, but Keenan Allen might be in 2022. Mike Williams is also a free agent in two years. And, you know, it might be a very similar thing to Darius Slayton, where we didn't think Daniel Jones was good at football and we didn't know much about Darius Slayton heading into the year. Maybe Justin Herbert and Joe Reed build some crazy chemistry in the offseason. And on the off chance he makes it onto this offense, he's just a deep threat. Or, you know, his, his yards per reception in college was disgusting. It was like 8.8. .8. But with his athleticism, I'd hope he could stretch the field a little bit because they don't really have that 
Um, you know, they had Tyrell Williams and Travis Benjamin could not fit that role. So maybe Joe Reed can do that. I honestly don't know who he is uh, very much as a player, but uh, as somebody who can just stash on your taxi squad, he's going to make this team because he is dynamic. He is a big athletic receiver. Uh, the chances of him being anything for your fantasy team aren't great, but it's, it's the same thing. It's low risk, very high reward. If he does end up being a starter for the chargers and he does build chemistry with a rookie quarterback in Justin Herbert. Dude, his, uh, his yards per reception is wild. He, in his freshman year, it's 19.3, dips to 10.6, jumps back up to 18.6, and then, like you said, in the senior year, he had an 8.8 yards per reception, which is just god awful. I saw his receiving number, 679 yards. I'm like, that's terrible. And then I saw he had 77 receptions, and he had, like, yeah. 119 targets. I'm like, what the hell happened yeah. in Virginia? Yeah, so, I mean, I didn't watch too much Virginia, so I can't really comment on that. But, again, like these late-round guys, right, you want to find guys who can – win and have multiple opportunities to get on the field like that's how antonio brown got on the field he was a kick returner and putt returner he was making plays like you want to try and make bets like this you don't want to try and get guys like like that k dude kj hill is not going to be a thing it doesn't make sense to me that someone like joe reed is getting drafted or even like wavered ahead of kj hill because the draft kind of tells you what you need to know right especially at these late rounds if you went in the seventh round you shouldn't really take a fifth round dynamic playmaker ahead of him um, so to me, it makes sense if I were to start off, I'm probably going to go back and look at some of my leagues to see if he's on the waiver wire here, uh, because the chargers do like to spread the ball around a bit. Um, you know, they've always had like that third wide receiver. It, granted, they aren't like fantasy studs by any means, but hey, they, still it, some value. <laughs> they still held some value. And obviously, you know, target volume and stuff might decline with Herbert and, and Tara Taylor there, but these are the types of playmakers you want to target, I think. And, you know, for us. Uh, you know, Noah says all the time, I say all the time, you just you want guys to get on the field because if you can't get on the field, you're not going to be able to prove your worth. And in these late round flyers, you want guys that can get on the field. And he's definitely like, it seems like they drafted him to kind of be that special teams guy. And, you know, let's see, let's see what he does with his opportunity. Yeah. And if you look at this entire list, the main focal point is you want to draft guys that are versatile, right? Other than maybe Adam Troutman. And we have one more guy that we're going to talk about after this, but like, all these guys can play multiple positions or get you fantasy points in multiple different ways, whether it's Jalen Hurts running the ball or Antonio Gibson catching the ball out of the backfield or being a running back and LaVisca Chanel and Brian Edwards after the catch. All these different things. Coaches love these shiny new toys that can do things in multiple areas of the field. If Joe Reed goes out there and he shines as a special teamer, what's to say that they don't just throw him out there in three receiver sets and see what he does? Austin Eckler was undrafted, and he was a huge special teams guy, and he made his way onto the field because Anthony Lynn valued that part of his game. I remember, I think it was two years back when Melvin Gordon got hurt and Eckler took over the load. And Anthony, they were asking Anthony Lynn, oh, do you think Eckler's going to be the starter for this team? He's like, nah, I really like what he does on special teams for us. Guess what? He just got the fucking bag because he's a beast. What's to say Joe Reed isn't a beast on special teams, make his way into the field and eventually become a good football player? Obviously, you're shooting for the stars with that type of conjecture. But, I mean, we've seen it happen before and there's a lot worse picks to make here, especially Donovan Peoples-Jones going as the wide receiver 19. Who I already said is just like a discount version of Joe Reed, who was picked later than him in the actual NFL draft, to a team that has more weapons and brings a worse, a similar but worse version of the skill set that Joe Reed brings to the table. So uh, I'm not going to be pounding the table for him being like a huge value, but he's somebody that you definitely need to roster. And I bet in like 90% of the leagues, he's still in the waiver wire even after your rookie draft. Yep. All right. Last guy we want to talk about is an exciting one, and we saved him for last because he is the prodigal fucking son. Cam Akers, no and I have been on this guy for a long time. Uh, you know, I've been trying to track him, like, even since his freshman year. Look, I get it. The O-line is not great, although it's not as bad as I thought it was. I think it's, like, 19th, so, like, slightly below average. Um, but, man, like, the talent is just is just there. I think, you know, a lot of people find different ways to discredit him, whether it's, you know, the yards per carrier or what have you. But, like, at some point, man, like even as a numbers guy, you just got to open your eyes and watch, right? Like, and when I watch Cam Akers, I see a star. He went to the combine. He smashed. He has a draft capital. He smashed. He checks every single box. He landed into a spot where there is a clear path to workhorse volume, despite all the chatter. Look, I get it. You know, coach is going to say stuff like, you know, what do you expect coaches to say in May, right? Like, you know, people are like, well, Sean McVay said it's going to be a running back by committee. Sean McVay says, hey, what do you mean to say? Daryl Henderson stinks. Like, that yeah. that pick. Malcolm Brown like, what, sucks like, what, too. What do you expect them to say, right? Like they have vets on the team. The coaches aren't going to come out and say, yeah, our team is trash and we really need a cam makers to step up. That's not what's going to happen. And they're not going to say it for most rookies. It's, it's a spoken rule. If you draft someone like in the top 10, there's really no avoiding it. Like when they drafted Ezekiel Elliott, nobody in Dallas was like, 
oh, well, he's going to be in a committee with uh, whoever was there at the time. Joseph Randall. Yeah. Like Cameron like when they drafted Miles Sanders, what did they say? He's going to be in a committee, and he was in a committee. When they draft these guys in the second round, they're not going to just completely punt their veterans and lose their locker room. And it's just too early for coach speak. And I think the talent here is undeniable. Darrell Henderson, as much as I loved him last year, did absolutely diddly shit last year to actually prove why he deserved more touches on the field. Malcolm Brown is a jag. We know that. With the exception of a couple of touchdowns, he was great. But we know what they did with Todd Gurley, right? And, you know, people will say, I guess, Todd, you know, they saw what they did with Todd Gurley, so they're going to, like, change up the philosophy and not make him a workhorse or whatever. But at the end of the day, like, talent's going to get on the field. You don't spend a second-round pick completely irresponsibly, may I add, when you only had a couple picks in the draft to improve other situations. You spent one on a running back. As much as I love Cam Akers, that was a fucking mistake. And he spent one on a 90-year-old wide receiver who probably plays out of the spot for his entire career because he has a dad that played wide receiver, I guess. It was just horrible draft all around. But now that they've drafted him, the draft capital is there. The opportunity is going to be there. And he's going as the seventh overall pick in Superflex as the running back five. I think you can get him in most of your leagues because a lot of people have Swift over him. I have Cam Akers over DeAndre Swift, and I've had it that way for a little, for a little while now. I think Noah has it the same way. He's just someone I'm targeting. I have a ton of shares of him. I'm going to try and get more. I'm going to try and trade for him. I think you're going to trade for him because if it works out, he's one of those guys where like maybe his floor is a little bit lower, but if he hits, I would not be shocked at all if he outscores every single other running back in this class over the next few years. He has that type of upside. Yeah, and the Rams do have a bad offensive line. We saw it last year, but if you look at the starters that they had last year, three of their starters played less than 10 games. Austin Corbett played seven, Brian Allen played nine, and Rob Havenstein, who I believe is a pro bowler, played nine as well. So they also didn't have a lot of continuity along that line. I'm not so sure how many of those guys are returning for next year, but I believe all of them are because two of them are very young and Havenstein's going into his fifth year. So I think he's still on the team. So they'll probably get a little bit better. We've seen Cam Akers do work behind a bad offensive line. By do work, I don't mean like nine yards per carry. He averaged like half of that. But the fact that he was playing decent enough defenses and he was running behind basically the worst offensive line in college football leads me to believe that if he's not put in a great situation, he's still going to be able to produce because Daryl Henderson wasn't able to produce back here. And in Memphis, that scheme is basically just open up the biggest hole possible and run straight. That's not the case for the Rams. The fact that Cam Akers has been put in a situation similar to the Rams and produced and Daryl Henderson didn't shows me that along with drive capital that he's going to be the starting running back in this team. Mike, I totally agree with you. I would not be surprised if in his rookie year, he commands maybe not the biggest workload, but the highest snap share of all these running backs going inside, like the top six or seven, maybe aside from Clyde Edwards Hilaire. But, you know, you consider Mark Ingram is sharing a backfield with J.K. Dobbins. Uh, Marlon Mack with his 28.5 reception share in a backfield with J, uh, Jonathan Taylor, DeAndre Swift and Carrion Johnson. I won't be surprised if Cam Akers is a guy who sees like 60 to 65 percent of the snaps. And if that's the case in his rookie year, I mean, this guy's the limit. People are still sending offers for David Montgomery, who sucked last year. He wasn't efficient. And he's in a bad offense. What if the Rams just completely turn it around? And what if he is a 60 percent snap share player? You're going to be able to get a lot more return on your investment. And that's not me saying you have to trade him because I totally believe in his talent. If he does get 60% of the snaps and he is good, you just lucked your way into maybe a top 10 dynasty running back at the 107. So uh, we're not saying the guys ahead of him ahead of him are bad picks. It's just that there are so many good picks that you can afford to just wait, trade back, and take the last running back off the board and have a very, very good player in a decent enough situation to return fantasy value because Todd Gurley was a top 12 running back last year with one knee and two offensive linemen. Yeah, I mean, he's going to be involved in all, all aspects of the game. He is going to be good in pass pro. Uh, like I've seen, like I've seen the film cutups that we've done for him where he just lays guys out and he is not scared of contact both in running and in pass pro. And you just love to see that because you know, the Rams are going to need help on that. And I know damn well, Darrell Henderson isn't blocking jack shit. So in those third down uh, passing situations and even just uh, pass pro situations, he's going to be on the field. And I think, I think, you know, you said 60%. I wouldn't be surprised if he kind of ventures into that 70% uh, snap share going into later in the season once they kind of see what type of player he is. Because if they were to draft someone to replace a Todd Gurley, Cam Akers, I think, is that guy. He is that, like, athletic three-down threat um, hybrid. His running style is even, like, pretty similar. The way when, when Cam Akers hits the edge, he's gone. He's gone. I've seen, I've seen it too many times. He's one of the best, like, to-the-edge runners that I've seen. And, you know, he has a lot to learn on the interior uh, because he 
you know, admittedly played fucking quarterback when he was in high school and he only started playing running back in college. So he's got a lot, a lot to learn. But if he's able to kind of hone in those skills and that raw, natural, God-given ability, I think he is going to light it up in the NFL. And I'm super excited to see how he develops. You know what? If you want to wait, I'm sure he might even struggle early on, right? Like very similar to Miles Sanders, like not very refined runners or, you know, not great vision running backs coming in. But the athleticism that they do possess and the playmaking ability they do possess is going to carry them down the field. So, look, I, I, I've i talked about him enough. You know, we've talked about him enough. We've probably staked too much of a reputation on Cam Makers to the point where if he busts, we're probably going to cancel the show forever. But if he doesn't, which I'm hoping he doesn't, it's going to be an exciting time. And I think he's someone that's very attainable. He's very affordable, I would say, right? Like, you, you can't always get the CEH and, and uh, Jonathan Taylor. is going to be just way too fucking expensive, even the J.K. Dobbins. But I think Cam Akers is, is attainable because he's someone where the community is still pretty split on, right? You have guys like us who are diehard Cam Akers truthers. You have other people that are, like, diehard anti-Cam makers for whatever reason. Uh, there isn't much to in between. So if he hits, it's going to be – it's going to be super sweet. It's going to be a bloodbath because we're going to be like, see, I fucking told you he was a faller. But if he misses, they're going to be like, you guys are idiots. I'm like, all right, well, sorry, we're idiots. So it's going to be an exciting time. Make sure you get him on your squads. Get some exposure to him. Please, please, I'm telling you, he's going to be a star. Yeah, if you want to see our full thoughts on Cam Akers, you can check out our Discord where we do in-depth player reviews. We finished them all off now, but it was basically like the top, I'd say like 15 uh, dynasty rookies coming into the year. And yep. we talked in depth about Cam Akers. There's like videos dubbed in over him as we're talking about the skill sets that he brings to the table. So you can check out the Discord in the description, uh, the first pinned comment you'll see down below. And I believe it's under 360 rookie, rookie Review. Check out the pinned comments. Click his video. It's like 10 minutes long. It's probably one of the best videos you'll ever see because you don't get to see our faces a lot. You get to see Cam Akers run the ball. And that's one of my favorite things to watch. Also on the Discord, you can sign up for leagues. We are on our 51st league being filled right now. It that's is... Good. It is crazy. We That's like over 600 people. They're not all different, but like 600 spots have been filled in these leagues. People are having a good time. There are some issues here and there, but overall, people think it's a very good way to not only like see ADP because we're posting finished draft boards and we're going to be working on an ADP tool soon enough, but um, just talking dynasty, talking stocks, talking memes, talking whatever you want to talk about. We're talking everything. Yeah, we got, I think, close to like 2,000 members in there right now. So it's completely hectic, but it also means you get to talk to a bunch of like-minded people who want to talk about Dynasty. So uh, it's definitely a great outlet if you are just starting out or if you're a veteran player looking to play with other people in that league. And we are also starting up the Triple B, the Bunk Bit Breakdowns Listener League. We just got our 12th member. So stay tuned for that. I'm sure in upcoming episodes, we'll talk about it more. But if you haven't been told that the league is starting yet, which I think I reached out to all of you guys, uh, it will be starting in the next few days. I'll get things set up and I'll start to invite you guys to the league. Yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be awesome. Look, I probably spend more time on the discord. I don't know about, you know, I spend more time on discord answering questions than I do on Twitter, uh, just cause it's like it's, more it's natural Twitter should be. It's just like yeah, helpful, it's more natural conversation healthy discussion. Yeah. I mean, I don't know about healthy cause we talk a lot of shit <laughs> too. You know, I uh, make fun of people, I trip people, people trip me back, which is what I love about it. You know, people aren't scared to voice their opinions and you know, it's just a, it's just a great community. I think it's like, Honestly, like I've been a part of a lot of different communities. I've been a part of like fantasy footballers, uh, you know, like nerds forums, like DLF forums and Twitter and all this stuff. I think in terms of like dynasty, like just like evergreen playing field, if you're trying to get into the space, it's just a great place and it's free, man. Like we're just trying to offer it to you guys. Hopefully it's helpful. It's a great community. And, you know, people thank me all the time or thank us all the time about having it there. And we're just trying to have a good, good time with everyone and just, just make it, you know, make it available to everyone, you know, during these times. Everyone needs time to burn. So just get on there, shoot the shit, talk shit to me, talk shit to Noah, whatever you want, you know, we're on there. Uh, just finger click away. Yeah, and we're also doing Q&As and roster reviews and upcoming videos, probably not in the next few weeks, but after that. And if you guys need questions answered or you want us to break down your teams, shoot us a question or send a picture in that in the required channel or the corresponding channel. And we'll get to that in a video. You might be featured. We might give you some pretty helpful advice. And if we don't give you advice on what to do, there are like 1,998 other people that want to help you out with your team. And they're all very helpful. It gives you differing points of view because we're just two people. The other thousand or so people have different points of view and they, they might explain things better than we do. And yeah. you get just, it's just a great place if you're, if you're playing in dynasty, because quite honestly, there aren't many other outlets 
and I don't want to sound like I'm bragging, but there are many other outlets that provide the the depth of coverage that that Discord channel brings. Yeah, I mean, I even have my sample bylaws in there, so if you want to just rip that and just start your own league, super easy to do. Um, yeah, it's just just a great spot. All right, before we leave, this week's narrative, hit it. <laughs> This week's narrative, we need to pay attention to coach speak in May. So when I say coach speak, I'm talking about the Sean McVay coming out and saying, you know, we're going to run a running back by committee. We don't know who's good. And, you know, we're going to have everyone on the field. Or when the Colts say, Marlon Mack, you are not dead. We still love you. Even though we drafted one of the best prospects to come out in the last decade, we still love you and you're still going to get your touches. Clyde Edwards Alaire. You need to earn your job. Even though you're a first-round draft pick and the first running back off the board, we're going to save touches for Damian Williams, uh, the traveling salesman that's gone from team to team and never had a solidified lead role. Like, I think I see a lot of this on Twitter. Um, you know, everyone's, like, reaching this, like, see, like, I told you it was not going to be a committee. And I told you this. And, like, at the end of the day, I just, like, step back and say, look, it's May, right? That's one. And actions speak louder than words. When someone trades up the top of the second round and takes the talented running back in Jonathan Taylor, that tells me more than I need to know about Marlon Mack's future. When someone uses one of their like three picks when they had fucking a million holes everywhere else to draft Cam Akers in the second round, when Darrell Henderson couldn't even get on the field ahead of Malcolm Brown last year, that tells me all I need to know. When someone takes freaking Clyde Edwards Alaire in the first round, and says he's a better Brian Westbrook, and he was handpicked by Patrick Mahomes, that tells me all I need to know. It might not be in the first five weeks. It might not be by week one. But you better bet your damn self that they're going to be leading their respective backfields by the end of the season, if not earlier. And if we're playing dynasty in this game, and it's a long haul. So if you think that it's going to be a running back, by a committee where Jonathan Taylor doesn't eventually take over, I don't know what to tell you, man. If you're not betting on Cam Makers, I don't know what to tell you. If you're fading Clyde Woods Alaire because you think Damian Williams is going to hold him back long term, I cannot help you. Like, what do you have to say about this stuff? Mike, how do you know a coach is lying? How do I know a coach is lying? They're when always they fucking, their fucking mouth. They're always fucking lying, dude. <laughs> always. They never tell the truth. I'm sure Anwell wants to believe that Marlon Mack is going to be some crazy receiver out of the backfield, but we've seen for three or four years that they just don't want to use him in this way. And for as much as they want to see, it's an RBBC. And Naheem Hines is going to get his work. Marlon Mack's going to get his work. And JT is going to maybe get his work. You mean to tell me a six foot, 230 guy that can run a 40 time faster than my 2002 Trailblazer is not going to go out there and demand 200 plus touches in his rookie year and from there on out be the stud workhorse that we believe him to be after being a second round pick isn't going to happen? I don't know what to tell you. Like all these blurbs are just for people on Twitter to affirm their beliefs for the next three months until it actually happens and they see that they're wrong, but they're like, oh, well, the coach said it was going to happen, so I was right in that moment. Don't listen to the coaches. Coaches are dumb a lot of the time. Like, dude, the Super Bowl, they were still thrown with Jimmy Garoppolo after, like, yeah. running the ball a million times, and that's what brought them there. Like, you, you can't believe coaches. They're all idiots. This has turned into, like, coach bashing. But, like, you spend that much draft capital on a position that is widely believed to not matter, and then you think that they're just going to waste that draft capital and never use the player. Like, Dave Montgomery saw well over 200 touches last year, and he was never really good at any point of the season. I'd be willing to bet that each and every one of these running backs chosen in the second round, aside from AJ Dillon, is going to command a near work, not workhorse, but like a 50% uh, snap share and over 200 rushes in the rookie year. And be what, at the very least, what we saw to Miles Sanders, where they just continued to progress week after week. And as Mike said, it's dynasty. We want these guys to just get better as their career goes on. And a lot of these guys were picked onto teams with aging running backs, whether it be Damian Williams, who's like sneaky 29 years old, and Mark Ingram, who's like 31, and Marlon Mack, who's on the last year of his deal, Daryl Henderson, who just sucks at football, and Carryon Johnson, who can't stay on the field. Like all these guys, they have the talent, they have the ability, and there's just a lack of talent on their roster for them to eventually take over the reins and become fantasy relevant players. So do not listen to these road of world blurbs because most of the time it's not going to end up being true. Yeah, I mean, it's just like, you know, all the way leading up to, like, the season, right? Like, what 
benefit is there for a coach to come out and say, hey, we're going to use one running back because of the rest of our running backs are trash. There's like zero benefit for them. It's good motivation for the other guys. Yeah, it totally kills your locker room. It like shoots your veterans in the foot. But also just like look at the history, right? Like Sean McVay had Todd Gurley and he used them and ran him into the ground. Like now he has Cam Akers, just like another Todd Gurley, Joe Mixon type clone, right? Andy Reid has always used a very heavy productive running back that led the backfield in touches, you know, from the Kareem Hunts, the Westbrooks, the LaShawn McCoys, like all he does is produce. It'll be different this time, Mike. It'll be different. He said so. (laughs) Like Marlon Mack was on pace for 282 rush attempts. And Marlon Mack is nowhere near the prospect that Jonathan Taylor is. At the end of the day, like, we, you know, we want to try and listen to coach speak because maybe it's something. But to me, like, I always let the action speak. And I think the action speak much louder than the words here. And I think, you know, you're going to have to be patient, right? Don't expect these guys just come out the gate and completely displace a veteran because, you know, it's a short training camp or maybe no training camp. But by the end of the year, going into next year, you're going to have a very clear picture of who the talents are and the best talents are going to win out because they have the draft capital. And once a team sinks that draft capital in, even though it may not be right, they're going to feed them the ball. That's just how it is. You got to try and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? You're going to try and justify the pick that you use on that back. So don't be worried about all the coach speak. I personally don't even pay it any mind, like whether it's positive or like negative. I just don't even think about it at this point in the year because it's too early. And like, it's like the coach says, like, look, it's too early. They don't know if Cam Akers is going to be a good player. But if you think Cam Akers is a talent, He's not going to be in a running back by committee. I can tell you that much. Imagine passing on Nick Chubb because Carlos Hyde was yeah. set to lead a committee yeah. going into his rookie year. Like, yeah. You're playing the long game, and you're not yeah. betting on these 28-year-old running backs that can't stay on the field. Yeah, you, like the Nick Chubb is a perfect example. Like Even back when like Chicago was like, yeah, we're going to feed Jordan Howard the ball because we think he can catch passes. How the fuck did that turn out? Not good. <laughs> Just like how they're saying now, like, oh, we think A.J. Dillon is a much better pass catcher than people give him credit for. Okay, cool. I'll wait. I'll believe it. I'll believe it when I see it. But just don't pay too much attention to coach speak right now. 100%. Right. Hopefully that's helpful. Uh, that's all we got. You got anything else, Noah? No, that's it. This video right. went pretty long. I thought it was going to be one of the shorter ones, but <laughs> we never fail to go for an hour and a half. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, hopefully it was helpful. We're going to probably move away from rookie content going forward and focus more on uh, Dynasty and the entire player pool. Uh, just given a lot of the rookie picks have gone. So hopefully it's a helpful episode uh, for those of you out there still with the rookie drafts. All right. Peace out, guys.